Good morning and welcome to the uh, Wednesday morning Bible study or, or, or devotional prayer time here at Faith Presbyterian Church. I'm so glad you're able to join us. If you have your Bibles, um, take them and go with me uh, to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. We went over Hebrews chapter 5 uh, last uh, time, uh, last, this past Monday morning, but this morning, and uh, Wednesday morning, we're going to go into Hebrews chapter 6. And, and once again, you know, I'm going to remind you that the uh, uh, the book of Hebrews is all about Jesus being greater than everything. Jesus being greater than everything. And so uh, as we are putting our trust in Jesus, as we are following after Jesus, it means that we dive ourselves and we live for Christ in all things because he is our great high priest. Um, he is higher than the angels. He is a uh, God of very God. And, and he has done everything necessary for us to be in relationship with with God, and so we are focused in on Christ, and and and, and what we see here in at the latter part of Hebrews chapter five and and in Hebrews chapter six is that there's a warning. In fact, we're going to, uh, I would say that this is quite perhaps the most stern warning that we see in the New Testament about uh, about making sure that you know Jesus, making sure that you are in Christ. Making sure that you uh, that you that your hope is in the gospel, and so it, we don't we're not sight we're not saved by works, you know we 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 don't say uh, look at that person uh, and look how they live they are saved by their works you know look look how good they are and, and their goodness is getting them saved in Jesus no no we're not saved by works but our works is an evidence of our salvation I mean it's a very simple concept our, our outward life displays our inner transformation our outward living expresses our inner transformation um, and so that's what the writer of Hebrews addresses here you know uh, he, he kind of dips into that at the latter part of, of chapter 5 when he says look some of you guys are, are still are, you're still lapping up milk when you should be diving into T-bone steak, theological T-bone steak, and, and and being nourished on the on the deep things of Christ. Remember, we talked about that Monday morning. And then he gives a warning to those who are still lapping up milk, who are still immature in their faith. And, and he kind of uh, implies the, the 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 idea that that you may not be saved in the first place if you're not growing in your faith, if you're not progressing in the gospel. Then are you even saved? Because when the Holy Spirit comes into a believer, there is growth. Now, the growth is slow. <laughs> Some Christians uh, grow overnight in their faith. And, and like one day they are a wretched sinner. The next day they are like a saint levitating three feet off the ground. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And some Christians, their growth is slow over time. But regardless, they, that these two pictures, these two illustrations of these two Christians that I just, I just gave you, what they have in common is growth, either quick growth or slow growth, but there's growth. And in their growth, they're acting. They, they're, you can see their transformation. You can, you can see Christ's likeness in them. And what, this, what, the, uh, what the writer in the book of Hebrews here, Hebrews chapter 6, addresses is, the, is, is that there are some who look very Christian-like. But because of the lack of the evidence outside of their life, are they really Christians? Well, look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Look at verse 1. He says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Now, he's not saying, um, let's not study Christ any longer. You know, he, he, he's, he's saying, let us leave the elementary things of the doctrine of Christ. You know, like Jesus saved me from my sins. Profound, simple statement. But yet, we got to go deeper. I mean, it's not less than that. The gospel is not less than Jesus saved me from my sins. But there's so much more to the gospel, right? And so he's saying go deeper into these gospel truths and gospel realities. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and, and of faith toward God and of, and, of, and of instruction about washing, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Now look at verse 4. All right, this is where it gets a little tricky. For it is impossible... In the case of those who have, now notice how he describes this person. He describes a person who looks and sounds like a Christian, but is he really a Christian? Listen to how he describes this person. In the case of those who have 
number one, been enlightened, who have, number two, tasted the heavenly gift, number three, have shared in the Holy Spirit, number four, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God, number five, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often fail, falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for those uh, sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. Now, many Christians in many different denominations will look at that text and go, aha, now here's proof that someone can lose their salvation. I mean, listen to the way this, this is described, right? This is someone who's been enlightened, someone who's tasted the heavenly gift, someone who shared the Holy Spirit, someone who has tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers to the age of come, to the age to come. But yet they have fallen away. They have lost their salvation. They have walked away from the faith. But natural fact, the writer of the Book of Hebrews is saying this: This person was never saved in the first place. It is possible. It is possible to be enlightened, to taste the heavenly gift, to share in the Holy Spirit, to taste the goodness of the word of God, the powers of, uh, of the ages to come. Now, notice the words he uses here. He uses the word enlightened. He doesn't use the word uh, uh, regenerate. This is someone who is wowed by the gospel. Wow, that sounds really great. Now, Jesus sounds really loving. It sounds good. I'm inspired. This is the one who's, who's inspired by the gospel. This is the one who's enlightened. But he doesn't use the more common term terminology of, of, of someone who, who is who's, who's saved. He doesn't say this person who is in Christ. It, it, this person uh, is regenerate. This person is walking with Jesus. This person has been saved by Jesus. He uses the word enlightened. Next, look at look what else he says. He says, uh, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared the Holy Spirit, have tasted. The, this is someone who's, this is the, this is the milk lapper, <laughs> if I can use that terminology. This is someone who's lapping up milk. They're just tasting. They're just dabbling. In other words, they haven't fully bought into Christianity because Christianity hasn't fully bought into him or her. In other words, this is someone who's not a Christian. This is someone who looks Christian-like who's uh, who's kind of like amazed by the gospel or, or inspired by, by 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 the message of Jesus but yet uh, Jesus is not in them in fact he makes that point with the illustration he gives at the very end of this look at uh, verse 7 for land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop, crop useful to those to those for for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God but if, the, but if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. So rain falls on the land, and if it falls on the land and it produces a good crop, it is useful. It is, in other words, you see the fruit of the rain. You see the fruit of growth there. It is useful. It is exactly what God wants. God blesses it. But sometimes rain falls on the land, and, and, the, and it produces thorns and thistles, and it should be burned. It's the second crop, the thorns and thistles, that the writer is warning against here. It's sort of like the, the parable of the of the of the sower and the seeds. Are you producing? Is your salvation being expressed outside of yourself? And that way you look and and you see, yeah, Christ is working in me. Look at look at verse nine. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work. Now he writes to me, he says, look, uh, that's that's some people, but we know you're not like that. We know that you are in Christ. And how do we know that you're in Christ? God will not overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may be you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You see what he just said there? He said, but we have hope for you. We know you are not like the thorn and the thistles. You, you are the, the crop producing a good fruit and God is blessing it. Why? Because 
We see the love that you've shown for his name in serving the saints. Uh, we see the work that you do for the sake of the gospel, the work that you do for the sake of, this, of the church. We see you laying down your lives for the sake of Christ. We see you dying to yourself for the sake of Christ. We see you doing all these things because you see Christ as the only one for whom you are to live and worship and breathe and have your being. We see Christ in you. We see Christ working out of you. We see Christ coming out of you. And so we know for you, you are in Christ based on the fruit that you are bearing. So Christians are to be fruit bearing people. We, you know a Christian, you know a Christian by the fruit that they bear. Now, just because someone is doing good things doesn't necessarily mean that they are Christian. But if those, if those people are doing good things in the name of Jesus, it's obvious that they're doing them in the name of Christ for the glory of God. Then yes, they are living for Jesus. Well, let's go on to verse uh, verse 13 because we're gonna run out of time here. Actually, we already have, but, but look at verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham having patiently waited, obtained the promise for people swear by something greater than themselves, and all their and in all their disputes, an, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his promise or of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so he says, this is how you know that you are in Christ, that, that, uh, that, that you are bearing fruit for the sake of Jesus. You're doing it all for the glory of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and, and I want to encourage you to keep doing it before you have this promise in you because of what Christ did. He went into the holy of holy places. He, he went behind the curtain for you to, to make sure that you will be saved and that you will be found in God. So I want to encourage you in this. Be sure that Christ has entered into the Holy of Holies for you in your place, into the presence of God to represent you before God. So there you have a sure and final hope in the promises of God in the personal work of his son, Jesus Christ. Two, allow that surety, allow that hope that you have to pour out into fruit, to be doing good unto others, to love your neighbor as you love yourself in the name of Jesus for the glory of God. so that many other people may come to know Jesus as their Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being so good and, and faithful unto us. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who stood in our place and did everything that we need to have done so that we may be in you. God, I pray that we go forth and, and bear fruit, even as, as difficult as it is in this time, um, with COVID-19 cases on the rise, and it's just a lot of uncertainty in the air, God, May we continue to bear fruit for your glory and for the goodness of your son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for these people. And I pray that your blessing rest upon them. And all these things ask your son's precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you uh, need anything or if you need prayer or just uh, someone to talk to, I'm, I'm here. Uh, be sure to call me, text me, write me, uh, email me. Um, but in the meantime, I hope the Lord continues to bless you and I hope to see you soon. God bless.